So Gregory, I, I get somehow confused. You are a rock star. Do you get really Grammys or do you get the gold medals? I'm kind of, what happened here? I, I got some medals, but I always wanted to be a rock star. I, I wanted to be Mick Jagger, but I couldn't sing or dance. So Are you sure? Can we can we do it today, maybe? Can we try it to? <laughs> okay, I'm saying let's do it. Welcome to all of you to our new edition of Leaders Who Have Something to Say. This is the place to get inspired with outstanding leaders' actionable advice. I'm Mariana Ferrari, and I'm going to be your host today. With me, Amsi Jackson, our executive producer, and our super welcome guest. This is Gregory Burns, who is an American athlete, painter, author, and motivational speaker who won two gold two silver and one bronze medal in the Paralympic Games before retiring, now listen to this, to the Ironman events. Gregory, it is such a pleasure to have you here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I have to say I have to jump up and down because I'm so happy to have you here. Well, thank you, Mariana. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, I love your energy and it's a, it's a pleasure to, to now be with you tonight. Is it contagious? <laughs> it is. Can, can we jump up and down? Okay. So, Greg, for for the people who don't know you, like I didn't know of you before, and I'm so thankful to Karine um, that she introduced us, that uh, I want you to start, for you to start by sharing your story uh, with our audience. Now, and before we start, I have to say something else to our audience before I forget. Now, you remember that you have the power with your keyword to start sending comments and questions at any time that uh, we have Mara, who's going to pull them up, and I will go through them with uh, Greg. So, Greg, now let's uh, start with your first steps and your kind of your upbringing. Okay. Well, I think um, we have to be on and share the from the beginning. My dad was in the Foreign Service, and our first position, his first position overseas, was in Jerusalem, in Israel. When I was a year old, we were there. I'd been there six months. I came down with the disease called polio. It was the first pandemic that I experienced. Um, polio left me paralyzed, basically from the waist down, um, and I grew up using crutches and braces. So being, I was, you know, from the get go, I was different, um, but I tried to make the best of what I had. And I think there was a, a couple of things along the way that really shaped me were uh, my mother was very proactive, very strong and very, uh, uh, she forced me in a way to grow up like everybody else. And we would, I, I remember as a five-year-old going shopping with her uh, at the supermarket and I'd be walking along next to her. And at some point I'd whoop, slip, fall, be, I'd be on the ground and I'd be, you know, looking around at the Pop-Tarts and the, you know, the Cheerios on the shelves and then, you know, trying to get up. And, you know, as a five-year-old with my little braces and crutches, it wasn't that easy. And, um, and I remember my mother not giving me any help, not, you know, leaning over and picking me up, uh, which must have been pretty hard for her, given that all the other shoppers in the supermarket would have thought that she was the Wicked Witch of the West, not picking up this poor little kid on the floor looking like an up upside down turtle. Um, but anyway, she allowed me to get up on my own. And I think the message there was, you got this. It's up to you. And it's going to be up to you. So I think that was probably the beginning of independence for me. And um, later, uh, when it was time to go to school, the first school they my parents took me to was a school for all sorts of children with different disabilities. And I remember distinctly not feeling that this was my tribe. I didn't feel I fit, fit in there. And they tried to take me to the regular school, 
Uh, but the principal said, listen, Mrs. Burns, you know, he's a cute kid, but, you know, he can't climb stairs and there's two floors and there's nobody going to carry him up and down the stairs to go to his classes. So I'm sorry, he can't go to school here. And my wow. mother, and she pushed back. She said, well, wait a minute. Can he go to school if he can do the stairs? And she said, he said, yes. And so um, that summer I, I practiced going up and down the stairs and um, then went back in the fall and proved myself, if you will, to the principal that I could. Climate so Gregory, climate. hang on one second. How old were you at that time? Six, five? Five, five, five or six. Five. Wow, okay. So you, you started training yourself to go up and down and you made it, right? Yeah, it was just, okay. for me, it was fun. I mean, for me, it was, I think part of it is always, you know, when people tell you you can't do something or don't expect you to do something or don't expect it of you, it come, somehow becomes more, you want it more. And I think for me, mobility, I'd been in a way, um, uh, it, 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 you know, people said, no, you, you're not able to, or you're disabled or you're not mobile. And I think part of me just wanted to, to, to be mobile and to prove people wrong and, and to show, you know, that I, I can do this and I got it. And um, so I think that was part of being, you know, pushing back and saying, you know, don't take no for an answer and, um, you know, you prove yourself. So, um from the very beginning you were different and i mean and you and i have discussed how difficult it could be to feel that you're different and how so many people do feel that they're different maybe not because they have a disability maybe not because they have a physical uh difference with the rest but yes because they might have a creative talent or because they might think different or maybe because of how they see the world or how they manage the, their companies. So um, you came up with a concept that I love that it's being the, the kind of the trajectory between something being that when you feel different, it's dangerous, but then it becomes magic. Can we go through that concept of yours? Well, I I think when we're different, we stand out or stand apart. And until we own our uniqueness, our differences, and until we accept them ourselves and, and um, in a way figure out what that difference has given us, how has that difference empowered us? So what is our secret power? What is our secret weapon? What is it, you know, if you've lost your vision, what have you gotten? If you've lost your sight, what have you, you know, if whether it's a physical or mental, um, challenges you know if you lose one thing we as human beings we we accentuate something else so what 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 were what are your secret weapons what is it that you're great at and so, then, so hang on hang on hang on one second what is your secret weapon yeah i think it's in it's a bit of perseverance it's a, a bit of a mm -hmm. yeah just taking the next step or taking the first step and uh you know, hoping that if I take the first step, the second one will be easier and, and just to keep going. Okay, uh, so that is kind of your achiever mentality somehow, because, um, you know, I, I remember from my, from my trainer, Tony Robbins, he says success leaves clues. You just have to follow them, but you don't follow the physical clues. You just follow the mental clues. You know, what's the mindset of that this person has that he can accomplish these outstanding things that you can accomplish? So uh, what can you share with us of your achiever mindset that can help other people uh, who sometimes feel that uh, they have a problem uh, that they cannot really solve that like you like you had when you were a kid or like you have, but it started when you were a kid. Well, I, I think going back to the, the, the original one, you know, one step at a time and you can't climb a mountain, you know, in one leap and, and realizing that, um, you know, breaking things down to, in, into bite-sized pieces. But I, I think something that um, came up while you were just saying that was, uh, I think intuition is something that, or trusting our intuition, or trusting our gut feeling, trusting that we do have answers, or that we will know what to say or what to do when we get to the next step. So that's why I say, like, take the first step, the second will be easier, because, you know, life is a series of highways that come into intersections and left or right. and. Um, 
I, we'd, I, I don't know about you, but you know, I haven't known all the answers. You know, as a kid, I had friends that were going to be doctors and lawyers and firemen, and I, I never wanted to be a doctor, lawyer, or a fireman. Well, I didn't want to be a lawyer, but um, you know, <laughs> you wanted to be a lawyer. Well, I, that was my parents thought I'd be a lawyer because I liked. To, they thought I liked to argue a lot. But anyway, um, but I think having that trust in yourself that uh, that. Take, not, I have this saying, which is um, going without knowing all the answers. You know, going without willing. knowing all the answers. That is so good. Being, that is great. Willing to take that first step, not knowing the step, second step, because you trust yourself, your intuition that, okay, I'm gonna, I don't know what's going to happen when I get to the intersection of the junction ahead. I'll have to go left or right or other. I don't know now what I'm going to do, but I I trust myself. I trust the fact that I, when I get to that intersection, I will know. And that's, I think that's in trusting your intuition, trusting yourself and um, trusting the process. Well, uh, there, there are many things, Greg, that you just went through uh, right there. First, you say, okay, so you have to have kind of the courage to take that first step yeah. uh, while not knowing all the answers. I absolutely love that. Now, there's so many people driven by certainty. They need to know exactly what is the next step and what is the following step that sometimes they just Paralyzed. stay where they are. They don't no. take the first step. You know, no. they procrastinate, they stop and they don't grow. So just a little before getting into this call, you and I were discussing about the mental process. I wanted to know... Uh, what thoughts, if you can think of, or if you can look back, or if you can think even now that, you know, when you're in front of a big uh, painting that you have to produce, what is that thought that drives you to that first stroke that you say, so yes, I will do it, you know, what, what is it about? Uh, somewhat abandonment, the word uh, abandonment, and, and and being free or having the freedom to, to do whatever, to take that first step and, and uh, to realize that I can correct course, right? I can change, I can, in a painting, I can paint over, I can, you know, I can wipe it out, I can do it. I, you know, there, there, are many, there are many options. Now, the problem I think find is, is when, is getting from good to great. And I, cause I think we, again, for me, getting started is not the problem. It's, it's, um, because maybe it's just this sense of, you know, uh, what do I have to lose? Or uh, I'm, I'm not afraid to start so much. I think that, that because then, um, because I can correct. But I think the, the problem for me is more that when you get to a place where something's good, and it, you may, it may not be great, but it's good, and I like it, and it becomes precious now, and now I'm afraid. Now I'm afraid that I'm going to... Oh screw up what I have so this other thing I used to say I did a painting called don't be afraid to give up what you have for what you might become wow and, that is so beautiful and, 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 and that happens in painting all the time like you know you 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 know you you save the precious bits of, oh I, this painting I love this corner here I know the rest of it's not well this isn't working in this but this is really nice and and so I get attached to the really nice or you know it's pretty good it really I've it, I like it, and I, I, I'm afraid to lose the parts I like, and, and and that's really challenging. Is then what do you do? And part of it is, is for me in painting, it's eventually if if there's enough, I, I, I know something's not right. The frustration will be greater that I will have to I will will myself to to give it up, to to paint over, to change it, to make a big change because the frustration of, of it, the way it is not being right just is too much. And so then I'm so willing Greg, to- There is so much here. Uh, let me unpack some of the things that you just said, because also I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying here. And, and I remember the stories that I read from you and, you know, and, and everything comes together. So you started swimming and one day you decide to compete. So you don't have you in your case, you, you're not fearful about taking that first step without knowing what is your second step going to be or doing that first stroke and, and knowing what the second one would be. But when you are at 
eight or nine finishing or almost, I, I'm going to say eight, because I, I always say that when we are in eight of 10, we stop being, um, we stop being the very good ones to being part of the next step or the next tier, which are the professional ones. So you were the best of your um, friends and now you suddenly decide to take the following step, which is you, you might get it wrong and be the worst of the professionals. How do you take that step? How, how can we take that step from being, going to, from good to great? That's a good question. I, I don't have a... I'm you sure don't know all the answers. Well, you said that, right? I mean, <laughs> you're coherent. <laughs> I love that. But I, but I, I mean, if I had to venture a guess, if you, if I had a, you know, if I had to throw something out there, and, and then part of that is what I just said, which is um, trusting that it'll, I, the answer will be there, or that answer to that question of how to get from. Uh, to start again, or how to reinvent yourself, or how to make that next step. Again, part, I guess it, I would say it comes back to self, your, the confidence in your in yourself, your, your self confidence that you you know come hell or high water, whatever you want to say, you you will you will straddle that, you will make it, you will get across the river, um, you will climb that mountain, and it it may be ugly or it may not be, but it'll um, you you know that it's in you to do that and and um and you trust that and then you believe that and believe in yourself and it's not that you always succeed i know I, I guess that's the other part of it is that, um you know we never know unless we try and um uh, you know if you succeeding you know is is, rel is, is sometimes relative terms i know it you know it, like in a painting when is it done it's different right. i think if you're a business person like you know did you hit your numbers that's pretty solid you know that's a big there's a yes or no right you you do or you don't so i think there are yeah that well is, yes 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 but hang on one second because here you're touching the the business area which is my area and i would s suggest that you know um it's it, it is exactly the same because yes you get to the numbers and that's that's it right you didn't you got them or you did not get them However, you have many strategies to get to the numbers. And in some, you're going to succeed. And with some, you're going to fail. And it's okay because you have many strategies. Now, people get stuck with one strategy and that's why, you know, then you get to the end of the line and, and maybe you didn't succeed. But it's like, you know, um, when you're shooting to the moon, I always say I have so many shots that, you know, I shoot to the moon or to the stars. And if, it, if, you know, if it doesn't go that way, then I have another shot or I have another shot. And I guess what you're saying, it's kind of the same, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. so. I, yeah. um, Gregory, I want to intercede here with, we have many comments that I, I'm going to start with the first one, which is from our mutual friend, Karin. Because she, she's making a comment that I think that it's going to add to your personal confidence. She says, thank you for sharing your stories and your mother's fortitude. What a contrast to the helicopter parenting style that we practice today and how we, can, we might rob children in the joy of succeeding. I believe that, um, that your mother, when she left you, find your way to get up, you know, and stand up and find that way or, you know, take the steps and train yourself to go through the stairs. Um, she was knowingly or unknowingly uh, building on your self-confidence, right? She was in a, she, she knew the long game, right? It wasn't, you know, and, and she knew the long game for me was I was going to need to do that. And she wasn't going to be around forever, obviously. Um, and I think the problem is that uh, maybe the these days, in, in, in to Corinne's point, 
um, maybe it's short term gains. It's 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 wanting to look good. It's wanting to have the kid into Harvard or wherever. And I think, you know, to my mother's credit, you know, she was a she came from humble roots, Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Father was a coal miner and a, and an ombudsman and a fireman. And um, she she was she was just pretty, you know, salt of the earth. And and I think that she was willing to be the ugly mother in the supermarket and a lot and and i just think of the other mothers that were looking at Absolutely. her and thinking yes. she was a she was a witch and and she was willing to take that because she knew the end game she knew the long game for me would be would be success versus let me pick you up now and i'll keep picking you up and and uh, yeah yes I, I please to all the mothers and fathers that have young kids, listen to what uh, Gregory is saying and sharing because that is so important. Thank you so much for that. And thanks to your mother because she she grew up a great kid. She ended up well, she educating always, a great kid. She always would say that the best thing that happened to Gregory was my sister, Roberta, who's two years uh, younger than I am. And meaning there was, you know, she, she realized we have four children and I was the second and uh, she realized that she couldn't after the she couldn't baby me, baby me because she had to take care of the you know my sister and then my second my other brother my uh, other Third. second brother as well. So there was you know part of it was practical, um, but I ended up benefiting from it. Great, great. So um, do you want me to keep sharing questions yeah. and comments? Okay, I'm going to share a, a question here uh, from Fe Feidra Ruffalo. She's asking or. Uh, is this being recorded to share? There is nuggets of wisdom on here that I would like to forward to colleagues. Of course, yes, it is being recorded and you can share it. Thank you so much for that. Um, then Francisco Pinedo. Wow, nice to see you, Francisco, here. Best greetings from Madrid. Thanks for the invite, Mariana. Uh, wishing everybody a great se uh, session today. Now, I just want to remind our audience that if you're uh, if you're listening and your English is not that great like mine, you can just shoot the questions in Spanish and that would be fine. We'll translate. Um, my translation capacities are even less good than my English. So, but I'll translate anyway. Um, Greg, so the other thing I wanted to ask you is looking back uh, to a, why do you think sports became so important to you us to become that gold medalist and then, you know, to break all those world records, some American records, and then to retire to, to the Ironman. You had to be somehow crazy, huh? Well, I, 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 either crazy or just nothing else to do. You know, I, I think my, my sports really were what galvanized me and, and gave me confidence and, and helped me to, because then I learned from the sports and training, like how to live in my other life, like whether when I worked in, if you will, corporate America for a while, but more importantly, in my art, like I, I learned, you know, a methodology and perseverance and resilience in my art as well. So and in my speaking, so the, the, the lessons I learned as an athlete translated to everything I've done in my life and um, not just keeping me healthy in body, but healthy in body, mind and soul. And I, I think that's what I think we're all challenged with is is balancing the body, mind, and the soul. And I think that sports and arts. I've been very fortunate because when I was in when I was in college, I graduated from college, um, and everything that I held held dear at that time kind of disappeared. And I won't go into details, but it was a lot of you know on a scale of one to ten, I lost a lot. I lost a lot of tens at the same time, and and I I didn't have any. I, I didn't think to go to counseling or a psychiatrist or something like this at the time, but um, probably could have used some help. But what I did have, it was a studio and I had the forest where I could go and sketch waterfalls and trees and make some, try to make some semblance out of the chaos, which is nature. Um, and then I had a swimming pool that I could jump in and swim in. And so those swimming and painting and being in nature were the three happy places, if you will, the things that rescued me when times were really tough and when, and I, I believe firmly that all of us need and have those happy places, whether it's cooking, dancing, swimming, drama, singing, whatever, um, those places we go to 
you know, like a bear needs his cave, you know, uh, to, to hibernate or to get away from things, you know, we all need those. Um, I needed them and I've, I've had them my whole life swimming and painting. So when things get tough, I know where I can go to recuperate, recover, recharge, refresh. Um, and those things give me energy and those, that energy comes back. Gregory, do you remember, um, I, I believe that most of us, we have some sort of inner self that it's brighter than the outer self, right? So while I'm listening to you, I'm thinking of your journey as something that started from the outside in, uh, because you started working with, with your body and making it outstanding and getting all those uh, medals and achievements in sports. And then you started working from the inside out and finding that artist inside of you. Do you remember, can you recall part of that moment where you made the shift from the outside to the inner world? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't think it was any one you know, monumental point in my life. I think uh, I remember in college, uh, my freshman year of college, uh, I had a roommate um, that was a, a very, he was a Christian and I wasn't, you know, I was raised as a Catholic. Uh, that don't, I don't know if that makes me a Christian or not, but I was raised as a Catholic because my mother and our family went to church. And, um, but I remember meeting this fellow and he was my roommate and I, um, and, and he was this really cool guy. And he wasn't, he, he wasn't evangelical. He wasn't pushy and everything. And I, but I looked at him and he's, I, I, I remember saying to myself, I said, he's got something that I really, I'm not sure what it is. He's got something inside that I would like to know about, or I'd like to, to understand and have, I'd like some of that myself. Um, and I think that was the first time, so freshman in college, uh, first time I really started to think about my spiritual side, my, um, mm. I don't want to say religious side, but a more spiritual side. And that's also when I started uh, drawing as, you know, more seriously taking drawings, you know, took drawing classes, took figure drawing classes, you know, freshman in college and draw naked ladies, you know, that's a recipe for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else hey, can one, you one second, hey, one, one second, that here, there we're hitting some interesting points there. Yeah, kind of went from we were talking, discussing that before, <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay so keep going i'm sorry i'm sorry but i'm going to ask you about your girlfriends yes i am yeah. i am well that, that was yeah so college was you know you you learn I, we we sewed a lot of oats in college and and um you know but there was the the yin and the yang i, I learned about a spiritual side at the same time I, I learned about the more physical side of you know having a girlfriend um with her with had her own uh, anyway had her own room and and Anyway, so the uh, yeah, college was a, was a anyway. Like he doesn't want to go there, people. I mean, are you listening to him? It's okay. He doesn't go want to go there. We he's won't a gentleman. go. He's a, Not he's for a now. He's a gentleman. <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, Gregory, as we're talking uh, about you know your strength and the perseverance um, and the resilience as well. Bahia is asking here a question. She's saying, thank you so much, Greg, for uh, sharing your experience in a moment where people are struggling with their mental health. How can uh, we use art to support emotional well-being, especially in the workplace? Yeah. Um, I've been very fortunate to, to do workshops with, I would call, common criminals, which are executives. I'm, I'm being I'm joking. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking here, but this hey, is so good. I have been I have been fortunate enough to work with a company, um, and I I did dozens of workshops with executives. In fact, we did one uh, with a thousand executives at one time at one conference in one hour, and it was amazing to watch these adults that probably when they got up that morning and came to work or came to the conference had no idea that they were going to create art with their colleagues. Uh, and yet at the end of that hour or two hour session, these adults were acting like the eight year old kid who had just kicked his first field goal or did her first pirouette on the ice or whatever. And it was, it, it's an amazing, it was an amazing, like 
the light went on and I, and it, you know, I've known my whole life that art heals and I've watched it in myself, but I've watched it in children. I've watched it in students and I've, I've watched it in, in adults. And I've seen how uh, people, when they engage in art, you know, for just for fun or as a, a way to work with their colleagues to team build or whatever, communicate and share and trust each other. Um, it, it, it's a win-win and it really, it, it does heal. In fact, I'm in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna go to Eastern Europe and care of the American embassy and, and do some art workshops for some Ukrainian refugee children. We're gonna give them art supplies and I'm gonna say, hey, kids and guys and girls, and you know, listen, this is what I do with these art supplies and here's a little sketchbook and here's some, so you know, what, look out the window and just sketch that tree or look at your sister and draw her face or how about your mother? And so trying to just get, get people to do it, you know, give them the opportunity or give them the time or encouragement to, to you know, I, I can't see that corporate America is going to have an artist in residence, you know, in every, in, in every pot, you know, um, companies have to be successful enough to be able to have these extras. Unfortunately, I think it's seen as an extra a mental, you know, uh, uh, mental health well-being and emotional well-being are, I think are becoming well, more. Well, yes, but also if we think of uh, mental well-being as being a, a key part of performance in people, then that becomes a business issue. And then the other, on the other hand, I'm I'm putting pieces together here. But when you think of art as being such an important part of unleashing people's creativity in a world that it's becoming every day more and more competitive, I think that if you put the two pieces together and you think that with just a workshop of art, you can unleash the creativity and you can foster that well-being in people, then I think we have a gem here. Totally. I mean, I totally agree. It just, you know, it's conv it's convincing the CEO or the president or whatever that that's money well spent. And I'm being just practical here is, you know, you know, is it more important to, to go golfing in a conference or is it more important to give people a, a, some paints? Um, you know, I think there is well, but yes, and and how the human being works sometimes it's that we have to have the problem to go fix it, and usually CEOs are fixers also of problems. So once you start uh, feeling or seeing that the fat that you have in your body is creating that heart attack, for example, then you will start taking care of that uh, of that issue in your body. Same thing happens with companies. When you start seeing that your blindness to uh, well-being, for example, or to mental health or to spaces where people can create uh, is creating stagnation in the company, overwhelming in people, uh, not people not performing well, well, you have to be pretty blind if you don't see it and if you don't invest in it. That's my take. No, I don't know. Uh, I'm with you. We're on the same page, and I, I, I just I would say that they're giving people the opportunity to be creative and create art. You know, it helps them to think outside the box. It helps them to communicate with themselves, with their colleagues. Um, there's so many positives to it, and it's such a simple, a simple operation, really. Right. Yeah. Well, right. We still have more comments. I want you to start shooting questions also because you have great comments. Now I have to go back one second because I have a question that we were discussing before. Remember the girlfriends? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want you to have as many questions here uh, as you had girlfriends uh, on your upbringing. Now share that story for us, please. Which. which uh, again, I, I am a gentleman, but which which story would you like? <laughs> well, that we were discussing about your wife, um, something about your wife. You were saying that I ask you. So, is your wife your first girlfriend? And you said, "Oh no, 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 she's not." But I'm I'm a you know I I met my wife when I was uh, thirty six or thirty eight. So I had a lot of runway before that. And, okay, uh, yeah, a lot of runway. A lot of runway. <laughs> and, okay. I, a lot of I, I've I've had a lot of loves in my life, and um, but they, you know they um, yeah. They, it's but you were sharing with me um, this idea that I think that today we're I'm I'm going to 
I'm going to bring it to today and how people feel about what they what someone might think about themselves. You know, I teach, for example, public speaking, right? And in public speaking, people are very fearful of, of what other people might think of themselves. Now, when we're discussing your 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 experiences in love throughout um, your your years, you're sharing that basketball court and you crossing in, in, in crutches and braces. To That's just... sure. Yeah, so that okay. was, a, okay, that was, sorry, thank you for reminding me. No, I was thinking back when I was in, in junior high. So what was I, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old and, and going to the school dance in the gymnasium, you know, when you had the girls on one side of the room and the boys on the other, and then there was a DJ playing music. And then, you know, and you had to walk across this, the, the basketball court. And for me, you know, on crutches and braces, I had to, you know, hop across the basketball court to ask a young lady to dance. And, you know, on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, you, you're probably not thinking this guy on crutches and braces is going to, you know, he's not Michael Jackson. Okay. I'm not going to, but I dance and I danced and I, I you know, <laughs> yeah, to see you dancing. Well, that, that'll be another day, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it was a, um, but it was a, it was a, a leap of faith, right? Because, you know, you, I knew full well that there's a good chance that I'd get turned down and, um, and that happened at probably at least 50% of the time, like any guy, you know, I was turned down, but, but having the, I guess the confidence or the, or the desire, the passion or whatever it was to, to connect with the opposite sex, to make that, to dance, the dance of life or the dance on the gymnasium, you know, in, in the, in the dance hall, but, uh, you know, being, how beautiful is that? Wanting that yeah. The dance of life. I love that concept. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, now I, I do have tons of messages here for you. So let me go through some of them. Hang on. We had one here that, uh, Raquel Valero, she was saying, uh, we have the power in our mind. Yes, evidently. Then we read this one, this one, uh, Francisco Pinero comment, uh, the importance and power of having happy places, example for arts or sports. Uh, I love that. So uh, thank you, Francisco, for pointing that up. Um, we're going to speak about happy places, by the way, next Wednesday with our next guest that tomorrow we will announce it. So, but just stay tuned to that. Um, then Baia said, oh no, Darren, she said, Gregory, um, Burns, thank you for sharing your leadership and for being so transparent. Yes, that is something I, I would say not only transparent, but you're so authentic, Greg. So thank you so much. And I keep calling you Greg, and I know you, you don't want me to call you Greg. Please don't hang up on me. <laughs> it's it's just a way of, of just no you know, uh, loving you somehow. So Bahia says, very good point, Mariana. Thank you, Bahia. Um, Karin is offering an idea here uh, from our speaker to uh, for our everyday lives. Um, carry a small sketchbook and pencils or pens uh, or doodle, draw, whatever. It's the focused and concentration which rewires our brain and being, Gregory explains. When we're done, okay, so... We'll go through that uh, long comment, but I think it's so important for, for all of you. I think it's 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 a very good idea that Greg sh is shared and that Karim is just uh, pointing out right here. And also she's um, she's sharing one of her uh, of her pieces there. Marcy, she says, uh, appreciate your insight and inspiration. Greg Burns and Karen is driving diversity, equity, and inclusion is a key leadership imperative. What can business um, businesses across the world learn, learn from sports and art? That's a good one. Very good one. I don't know if, if sports learns about diversity. I mean, there's a huge discussion about that. Right. Well, um, you know, diversity, again, the, the diversity makes up a whole, it takes a village, right? And I think that that's one thing that we are, the world is becoming, or at least trying to move in that direction of inclusion, um, you know, disability, Black Lives Matter, white, you know, women's lives matter. We're, 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 we're in, we're into, we're in, we're moving in that direction. And, and I, I've always found that um, 
you know, in, in my life, being the unique, if you will, not the same, not like everybody else, but going for jobs uh, with different companies, uh, whether it's, you know, asking the girl to dance across the dance floor or asking a, a boss for a job. Um, there's always been this l level of having to prove to yourself, right? Or prove that you're capable or, or able to do that. And, and I don't think that's so different for anybody else. I, I, I think we all have to, in effect, prove ourselves to, to make it through the door, to get through the door. Um, but I think that in, uh, we, there are a lot of, uh, uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people with disabilities that have, don't, can't even get to the door. And, and that's uh, unfortunate. Um, and I think that that's something that is changing. And I, I, I like to see that. But what I found uh, working in, in corporate America was uh, hiring people with disabilities, like into basically call centers, if you will. They, the, the, the people with disabilities who worked in the call centers were more passionate and, and stayed longer um, and were more, uh, didn't, didn't quit as much as the able-bodied people. So uh, again, there, uh, anyway, we're, we're, we touched on another subject, which I don't think was- uh, No, but I think that if we go back to the sports and, and the inclusion and the diversity in sports and the learnings that that can have towards the business or towards a business case, I think that there might be, as Karen points out, uh, many learnings. And the one I'm thinking, and I'm sure that you as a, as a sports guy, you would know much better, but the one I'm thinking it's um, that when, when a team, for example, if we take a soccer team, which is a sport that I love, if you take a soccer team, you have to have the differences and people that have very different abilities in the court, right? So you have 11 players and those 11 have to be very different. In fact, when they are not, and, and they start not collaborating among them, among them, then it's when they lose. And on the contrary, when, when they find the way, when the coach finds the way for very different people to collaborate, then that's when it becomes an outstanding game. So I don't know. I mean, maybe we can interview a coach next time, but, but I don't know how you know, how do they work that out to make it work among people that are very different with very different talents? Well, I think what you're saying is when it's too homo homogeneous, homogeneous, is that the right word? And, yes, um, homogeneous. Maybe that's not, homogeneous. Homogeneous is not necessarily the answer. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, Greg, so uh, hang on, we have more comments here. Uh, my admiration for Gregory, I am a person with um, a disability, a physical disability for one lesion uh, in the spinal cord. And I would love to have the strength and, um, and voluntad, strength and drive, I would say, that you have, um, that you have, Gregory. Uh, I think he's saying um, hello and that she had um, enjoyed a lot our conversation. So her name is Noel Alfredo Peralta. Okay, Noel. I, I'm not sure that it's, it's a lady or a guy, Noel Alfredo. So, uh, but for him or for her, thank you so much. And I'm sure Noel, you have you have uh, talents that uh, you <clears throat> are not uh, you haven't fully actualized yet or not. But I'm sure you have the strength. There are strengths that you may or may not know you already have. So, okay. Uh, do you want to keep going with questions and comments, Gregory? Sure. Do you have yes? Like do you have yeah. time? You're you're so popular. See, and that's why I was so excited to have you here. Okay. So unleashing the inner strength and foundation using art is great, um, though it's a one-time session truly enough for a company or group of executives. What is the best formula as a one-time session leads to progress by potentially self-amendment or maybe diversion? Could Gregory suggest on how to deepen this important aspect? Does he have a platform to assist companies or work with another operator? Great questions. Great questions. We have a platform, we have a website. I mean, we've, we've been doing this for almost a decade now, but you've raised a good question. Is it a one-off 
and or and is it just a diversion or is there any staying power? Very good question. Um, I would argue that much of the time it's a one-off. Unfortunately, budgets uh, or interests or the change of the CEO, the change of the champion. Um, so things change and that's the way businesses in the world is so understandable. Um, I think the, the but idea- that could be the case, right? Ideally it shouldn't be a one-off. No, exactly. It should, be, it should be with the HR department. It should be something that we decide to do once every quarter, once every, you know, and then we structure it differently than just a one-off. The one-off is when everybody has a great time, they create some art that goes up on the wall in the office. And every time the people walk by it, they point at that and they said, I had something to do with that. And they, there's some pride there. So, I mean, there's, there's other aspects than that, but I think that's, uh, that's the one-off, but the longer term is to, you know, to encourage, uh, you know, I've done figure drawing classes in a, in a corporate setting. I've, you know, encouraged people to take sketchbooks to, you know, to play with their kids, to, you know, do, uh, take it, you know, on their own as well. So um, I think there are legs. We can put some legs on it. Um, Greg, for everybody, I think that you had more than 50 or 80 solo exhibits of art around the world. How many? I. I I yeah, don't recall exactly. More, more than 80, but it's more, in, more in 15 80. different countries. Yeah. So we've been doing, um, in the last 20 years, we've probably had 80 exhibitions in, in 15 countries. Yeah. So it appears that, um, that you, everything that you do, you become very successful. My, my wife would argue that I'm one of the worst dishwashers around. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 you, you, pick, you pick your battles wisely, and I, I, I've never excelled at dishwashing. So, but there are, yeah, but yes. Yes, okay. Everything that you do, at least you put your heart on and you commit, I would yeah. say, yeah. right? You persevere. Yeah. yeah. And you well, get to where you want to be. Yeah, because it's what you know that there's a there's something inside of me that's driving that that wants to to do that. And again, I, I'm not trying to be the best dishwasher in town. Uh, I know there's much more qualified people than that. So, but um, you know, painting and sport, swimming and and sports have been the where I've driven myself. You know, I've not driven myself. I mean, I I do write and I do kind of drive myself as a writer. But um, but I mean, and, and as a speaker, yes, those. Like those four things, I, I, I'm very passionate about those. And, and those are things where, that I, in a way that I'm passionate about because that's where I put my heart and that's where I express myself. And I express those, you know, the inner side, which you mentioned earlier, we, we talked on earlier, you know, the, 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 inner, the inner voice and the inner person. Um, and that's where that comes out more. And I, I've often said, I, I don't know all that I know until I write it, speak it, or paint it. And I think like, that's like this interview today, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> it, it kind of, you know, it's like a, it's like a fishing rod that pulls things out and I go, wow, that, that was, that's pretty cool. Did I really say that? Or did I really paint that? You know? And I think that's, what's exciting to me about painting and writing and speaking is that, you know, I discover, th I, I excite, I, I, I come up with some stuff that's just, wow, that's, that's pretty good. I like that. I mean, I'm, you know, and, and that it keeps exciting me. And, and that's one of the reasons I keep doing it. I keep painting. Say, well, you know, I, I have enough paintings. I don't need to make more paintings, but I keep painting because I think, you know, there's just, I'm going to discover, I'm going to just like the aha moments. Like, wow, take your, like, wow. like a beautiful woman, it takes your heart away or it takes your, you know, it takes your breath away. Well, you know, that can happen in. in so other. Gregory, can you share with us that painting that you have right on your back, what is it? Yeah, cool. this is this is um, this is part of a series. I, I did a series called "The Hero's Journey" about you know Joseph Campbell's yes. hero's journey, and this is one aspect of it. This is uh, this is resolve. So that you know, I, I I simplified Joseph Campbell's you know I think it's sixteen part hero's journey, and I I broke it down into and I made paintings and a series of paintings several times, which uh, in in four parts. Like I call it home homeostasis, start where you are, you know, where you are, and then depart, number two, leave, take a trip, get married, go to college, get a job, you know, number three is discover, 
find, uh, learn, contemplate, and four is return, go back to home and hearth and share what you learned along the way. So that's a kind of this four part series. And this is a painting from that series called Resolve. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a uh, it's talks about that. And now, so and now I have another question for you. So if you, if you were to paint Gregory's journey, hmm. what would it be about? Uh, I guess it would kind of be like an iceberg with the mountain, the top of the mountain above and the bottom of the mountain bigger below and the, the mountain top being the, the physical one, the, the sports and the physicality and the bottom being the more emotional, um, spiritual side that is deeper. Um, I, that's off the top of my head. That's what I think it would look like. Okay, but then maybe we can we can uh, brainstorm uh, in a different session what would be the steps for you to go from A to C, uh, because I think that that your journey can teach so many people um, on how to kind of swim through their lives one stroke at a time, like you did. Yeah, I, that would be I would be happy to do that. It, it's um, it's it's all it's still learning for me and it's still trying to figure it out you know we're uh, we're all on this bus together and we're you know we're all doing the best we can and i think that's you know if anybody and anything can help you to do that uh, a coach what you've just offered uh you know and talking with you the lead up to this talk has been you know communication with people um You know, that's where the stuff comes out. That's where the magic is. That's where the, we find, we find things, we discover what we don't know, or we discover, you know, what's hidden up below the surface. Yes. In, in conversations, we discover so much, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to just point out here, uh, Gerald, that he, Gerald Hammond, that he's saying, thanks for sharing uh, great content. I have to uh, say that Gerald, for me, He's uh, the innovation guy, the go-to innovation guy. And, and then you too should, at one point in time, should communicate uh, because he had, um, he works on innovation. I think he was the most innovative person because he started working on innovation when nobody knew the term. So this started many years ago. And uh, I've always believed that the, uh... I, you know, I'm not a, a, a stellar business person. I've had some business career, if you will, but but I've always believed that painting and this methodology of painting um, that I have, or many people have, I, I think there is some, like, uh, there's, I think there's, I do a, a, something called what great leaders and artists have in common. And I think that there are some real crossovers between painting and innovation, finding, you know, going without knowing all the answers, you know, in motion, we find directions, you know, don't be afraid to give up what you have for what you might become. I mean, there, there's a lot of these touch points where I think. Um, yeah, uh, Gerald, Gerald had uh, for many years, uh, the Thinkubator in in Chicago. And, and that was a place where companies would go to do their, their um, brainstorming sessions for innovation. So that's why I thought, you know, with your arts and his experience in that creating that Thinkubator, I think that you should you two should get together. Anyhow, I would love it. Gregory, I know it's it's past midnight for you, uh, midnight and 53 minutes, but I, I, I just enjoy so much having you here. I thank you so much for being our guest. I thank uh, Karine for introducing us as well. So I have to say thank you and I'm looking forward to the next one. This conversation should not stop here. Very good. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for uh, bringing things out and uh, being the, the genteel hostess that you are. So thank you oh, very much. And to your you. audience as well. If, uh, if anybody needs to contact me, I'm, as you can say, transparent and authentic, but uh, um, I'm easy to reach. Okay. And uh, for everybody, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, here on this event and also on a post uh, in my LinkedIn, I'm going to share both um, Gregory's 
uh, homepage or, or web page, and also many pictures that he shared with me that I think that they were so outstanding. When you were talking about diving and painting, I was remembering those pictures that you, you shared with me. Uh, can I share those on my yeah, LinkedIn? Yeah. Yes. Sketching okay. underwater, yeah, with a on a, on a sketching plate. underwater with a fish here that you can't imagine. <laughs> I was like, oh my that god! A, that was a moray eel. That was a moray eel, or it was a it was a manta ray. Yeah, yeah, that wow. was that, that was very way cool, very cool. Yeah. Were you not scared? No. 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 What are they, you scared they, about? No, no, they, you know, I, I'm scared of a lot of things, but not manta rays. I mean, I've I've been a, I've swum in a place with like 50 manta rays at the same time, and these manta rays are the size of a bus. You know, they're huge, and they will they're mating and they're eating and they're you know and they're they're dancing, they're swimming around, and they never ever hit you as a swimmer or uh, you know they're so so agile and capable, and they're they're nine foot across. You know, they're huge. They're 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 but they're so delicate in that sense. And so I've never had a fear of them. I actually went, I was swimming with dolphins once. And I remember I went out and I was with another, another gentleman and his son. So there were three of us, right? There were two big ones and one small one, the, the son. And this pod of about seven dolphins swam up towards us. And I looked at the pod and I could realize that there looked like one baby was in the middle of the pod. And these two, what I would say, alpha males or females came out towards us to kind of check us out and then they seemed to relax and then they just stayed around and what I think happened this is just my guess but I think the dolphins saw that there was a, an, a, two adults and a baby so we're we're not going to attack them we're we're a family right because later my friend and his son left and it was just me by myself the same pod came back and this time they looked at me and they saw me by myself. And I don't think they, I'm not so sure they thought I was as safe as I was with the father and son. So anyway, um, I've had some incredible experiences with nature, underwater, scuba diving and snorkeling around the world. And, uh, but the, yeah, dolphins and manta rays and, and more eels. The picture you have is me with the more eel. It's, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, that was outstanding. And also, uh, can I share a secret with our audience? You want to ask me first or you want to ask me in front of the whole world? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, want to, I want to ask you in front of the whole world. Okay. But it, it was your suggestion. So, you know, I think that you're going to be happy if I do share it. Okay. <laughs> um, that we are thinking on doing uh, the St. James Path or the Camino de Santiago with Gregory and a group of you. So people get ready because that has to be about perseverance and taking that first step, right? Excellent. Right? That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so was it okay if I shared that? That was perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> okay. So that you go to sleep. 6 57 p.m. in Spain and 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 almost 1 a.m. Um, in, in Singapore. So. In Singapore, yes. So well, thank you so much, Gregory. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, okay. and I'm sure that our audience as well. So My pleasure. bye to all of you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.